Well, welcome everybody to another Hydroterra webinar. Great to see so many registrants for this one. We've got over 400 people, so obviously a topic of real interest to everyone. Today we have Matthew O'Brien, who's a freelance environmental consultant with a specialisation in using AI for data analysis. The topic today is AI, not Excel, using chat GPT for environmental data analysis. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There's a picture of our presenter, Matthew O'Brien. A little bit about our presenter. So Matt used to work at Hydroterra and I got to know him when he worked here and uh, really enjoyed his company. So it's a pleasure to have Matt here today. Uh, Matthew is an experienced freelance environmental consultant with a background in hydrogeology, contaminated land assessment and remediation, aquatic ecotoxicology and hydrographics. His career has been marked by a keen interest in leveraging technology to enhance the impact and efficiency of environmental work. Committed to exploring the integration of AI into everyday tasks, Matthew aims to streamline data analysis and technical report generation within environmental consulting. Despite the current hype around AI, his recent experience guiding leaders on AI usage has revealed that the environmental sector is still in the very early stages of adopting this technology. Matthew believes that the key to widespread AI adoption will be identifying highly relevant use cases that demonstrate immediate tangible benefits. I have a real interest in this because the overarching keen interest in leveraging technology is pretty much what Hydroterra does too, but at the sort of sensor and telemetry end of things. So there's a really interesting linkage between these two things to explore as this all uh, evolves. How did Matt end up doing what he does? Well, I have asked him and uh, he's uh, done a lot of study. He studied at Swinburne University, did a diploma in natural resource management. Then he went on to Deakin where he did a Bachelor of Environmental Science in Marine and Freshwater. And then he did an honours at Melbourne University in ecotoxicology. So he's a very well-established environmental consultant and he's then applying that knowledge with this technology to work out how we can do things more efficiently and better. He's a creative problem solver. He's also applied this sort of, well, I guess technology to music. He's uh, done a lot of work in that technology meets music space and uh, he would describe himself as a creative problem solver. In terms of asking questions, we have a lot of early bird questions for this one, just about the most ever, but we'll do our best to get to the Q&A as well. So to raise a question, please type it in the Q&A at the top of your screens. Why does Hydroterra do these webinars? Well, often because we're interested in the topics, to be honest, uh, but we do like to share knowledge, facilitate education, and provide a leadership position in industry. Our first ever official advertisement, um, the Australian Hydrographers Association is looking to run a training workshop and Hydroterra is part of this training workshop. But at this stage, we're just looking at what the interest levels are before they push the go button on it. So if um, it's, it's uh, training in water monitoring skills, so looking at doing it in Darwin on the 16th to the 19th of September. So 
anyone listening today that's interested in that monitoring side of things, AHA is just keen to get an understanding of the levels of interest of industry, and then they will put that on. So there's a link there, um, or you could just Google up that advertisement. Okay, I'll pass over to Matt. Thanks very much. All right, thanks, Richard. I'll just jump in and share my screen. Okay. Just tell us when you can see that, Richard. Yep, all good. All right, great. So I'll just jump straight in. Um, thanks, Richard, for having me here. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everyone turning up to learn something about um, one of the things I'm really interested in um, and passionate about, and that's using AI for uh, to solve problems in environmental consulting. And so I'm focusing on really Excel and uh, and ChatGPT, not because I've got a problem with Excel, but just because it's the most commonly used um, program that I see being used by consultants in the industry. Um, so I thought it was a good place to start, just to see whether we can try and find some problems um, in Excel and then try and, try and solve them uh, using ChatGPT. So what I'm going to cover in today's presentation, it's going to go for about 35 minutes. Um, and I'm going to look at how data analysis with ChatGPT works and some of the background things you're going to need to um, understand in order to help you to, uh, to work your way through using this, this new tool. Um, I'm going to look at Excel pain points. Um, and I've put a bit of effort in finding out what these common pain points are. So I've been out in the industry talking to different people and consultants that I know and, and just asking them, you know, what, what do you do every day which cause, A, causes you frustrations, um, B, that you do all the time, that costs you time, um, and then C, which, you know, there's quality issue or there's sort of some sort of limitations in using Excel for those, for those tasks. Then I've, after I did that, I went out and I tried to solve those solutions um, using ChatGPT, and I'm going to go through four examples today um, of solving those solutions. And then ultimately, we're going to end up at the end point of this presentation, which is essentially how do you automate these common tasks and how do you make them quicker? So for the things that cause you pain and they happen again and again in your job, um, how, do you, how do you solve them quicker by using artificial intelligence? So I'm focusing on ChatGPT. It's just it's still the most common form of large language model uh, that's used out there. Um, so, yeah, so I've just decided to focus on, on ChatGPT today. So I'm not going to go too much into how large language models work, which is, so ChatGPT is a large language model, um, other than to say that they're prediction machines. Um, here's an example of a little interaction with the chatbot where I'm putting in a little phrase of a, a song that we all know really well, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and then it correctly predicts what the next word is, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Why does it predict it? Because it's such a common song. It has a lot of that information in its extensive training data. So the probability of it predicting that next word is very high. If I were to put something into that chat uh, that was based on my own poetry, which doesn't exist in the training data or on the internet or anywhere, uh, it's going to be a much lower probability that it's going to be predicting that. So that's worth thinking about. The second thing is that when you're using large language models, um, they don't just give you the most probable answer they're trained to give you the most helpful answer. And that's important because they always want to be helpful. And that's why they lead you astray sometimes because they, they want to give you an answer to the questions that you have. So I'll just quickly just interact with the, um, for those of you who haven't used uh, ChatGPT before, you usually start in this kind of uh, view. You start with your chat. And normally up here, this is where you, you launch a brand new chat and then you can start interacting with the chatbot. Um, so, but when you launch a brand new chat using this little uh, chat icon up here, it doesn't know what you want. It doesn't have any history of your job. You have to start from the beginning every single time. So where we're getting at, where we're getting to by the end of this presentation is, uh, is an, an automation of a problem that you consistently have. So I'm just gonna quickly show you an example of what that automation looks like, just so that you can keep that in mind in terms of that's where we're heading today. So here's my little, custom version of ChatGPT, which I have developed. And I'm going to drop some data in here, which is just groundwater level data. There's about 10,000 lines of data in this, in this uh, CSV. I'm just going to pop it in. 
It brings it up and this little analyzing box pops up. I want you to just remember that because we're going to talk about that in a sec. I'm going to explain what that's doing. So this file, which I've put in, has got all sorts of problems. It's got no headers. It's got duplicate columns. It's got differing date formats. It's got missing values. It's got all sorts of stuff. Now, this chatbot, which I've built, already knows what to do. It's just transformed it. Now, look at it. It's got all the headers. It's got all the dates in consistent format. It's, it's, in, it's in the format that I need it to be in. And then I can just go download that file. Okay, so that's where we're getting to by the end of this presentation. I'm, I'm going to show you a much more sophisticated version of that. Okay, so before I ask you to just keep in mind that little analyzing box, and I'm going to make, I'm going to exp, uh, make a bit of an explanation of what that's doing uh, when the little analyzing box is coming up and, and how it can help you in making decisions using the model. So basically, this is a process. Previously, I just uploaded my file. And then I put in a prompt. This isn't a great prompt, but it's an example, help me with the data. And then what happens is that the large language model understands what your problem is. Then what it does is it, it, it writes program to try and solve your problem. And that's what's happening in that little analyzing box. And you can actually drop it down and see the program that it's writing. And it's writing in Python program. So the next part, which is I think the most useful part of using uh, chat GPT in a, in a chatbot sense, is that it, once it's written the program to try to solve your problem, it runs the program, but it also gives you an answer right there and then in the chat. And that's important because usually to execute Python code, you would need Python installed on the computer. You would need an environment set up. You would need something like a Jupyter notebook uh, to, to uh, develop and run the code. Um, and then all the necessary permissions that you might need in a large corporation for uh, getting that to happen. Some corporations won't even allow you to run uh, Python locally. So that avoids all those barriers and it allows you this process of iteration. So quite often you'll go through a trying to solve your problem and you get an answer and you're like, no, that's not quite the answer that I'm looking for. And you can iterate through a problem. And that's where the power of working with uh, large language models and products like ChatGPT comes in. It's this iteration. It's about, it's about having conversations. So the second, the second reason I wanted to talk about uh, what was happening with the Python um, and the Python environment operating in ChatGPT is that um, for those of you that aren't programmers, when you're working with a uh, programming language like Python, you have access to libraries. And if you haven't programmed, if you haven't programmed before, I like to think libraries, they're like Lego kits. And so think of the code as a big box of Lego. You can take it and you can try to build anything you want, but you don't have any instructions. And so it's quite unlimited. If you buy the, the kit for the car or the kit for the castle or the kit for the boat, it's much easier to like to end up at that end point that you want to be because it comes with the instructions. It comes, it's that particular Lego kit is for a specific purpose. And that's what libraries are for too. So in the little table to the left, you can see that there's three examples of libraries uh, that are available uh, in the Python environment in ChatGPT and the sort of tasks which they can perform. So I'm going to touch on this later and I'm going to show you one of the libraries and what you can achieve by just being a little bit familiar with what those libraries do. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the Excel pain points which I do. So the first one was by far cleaning and transforming of data. So this was the number one pain point. That's my number one pain point. Um, so that was that was quite consistent with everyone which I spoke to. Uh, the second pain point is merging of data. So for example, if you've got some groundwater level data and you've got some Bureau of Meteorology um, rainfall data, both in quite different formats. Um, and so that can cost a lot of time. Exploring data visually um, in Excel, I've got some feedback that that's a little bit limiting in terms of um, zooming in, zooming out, and just getting a good feel for your data. Um, and consistent format graph exports. So if you're, if you're doing one graph in Excel, I, I think that's quite okay, but if you're doing 50 and you want them to all be exactly the same format with consistent axes, formatting, size, and stuff like that, that can be a, bit of a, a little bit of a problem too. So, I'm going to start with the first example, and that's cleaning and transforming data. Um, and a bit of advice down the bottom there, it says that conversations solve problems. So when you work, some of you might have heard the term engineering, and all that really means in relation to large language models is that 
It means just having a conversation. So it's just like with a person, you can't solve a problem without having a conversation. Um, so if you ever find yourself uh, having a question and answer session with uh, something, something like ChatGPT or one of its one of OpenAI's competitors, um, you're not you're not getting the most out of the large language model. So you have to be having conversations. So I'm just going to jump into one of the um, examples <clears throat> of transforming data. So you just have to bear with me as I'll be doing a little bit of scrolling here, and I'll try and work my way through it. Okay, so that first example that I showed you in the automation where I put in my ground model level data that have lots of issues, um, what I've, uh, this is a process demonstrating how to get to that automation. Right? So this is the methodology that you need to use. So here I've uploaded my data, and the reason you can't see the data here is because of the first limitation of ChatGPT at the moment, and that's that because it's a programming environment that you're using, it's got a it's it's an ephemeral disk space. So it only lasts for a matter of hours. So the biggest limitation at the moment is that you can't just come back to this chat tomorrow and just continue with it because the disk space is timed out. So that's why you can't see the file here. So I've uploaded my file and I've, I'm starting with a prompt, which is really quite simple. And I would use something more detailed than this, but I want to start it quite basic. Um, and so my, my first prompt is, I have a data set related to groundwater levels. So I'm giving it some information and I need to clean and transform it to be suitable for producing hydrographs. So it's important to give it the context of the endpoint. Um, you'll find that you work, when you're working in these conversations, you need to learn to be quite detailed and you need to control how ambiguous your instructions are or your prompts are. And then I've added, I don't know what specific issues the data might have. Can you please help me to identify and fix any problems? So then I work through the advice that it gives. And then I get a chance to look at the data after it's dealt with it. So this is my first point of being able to actually eyeball the data and check it. And this is important. You're going to see that all of these examples that I'm giving you rely on you having this quite um, uh, a disciplined checking process as you're going through these chats. Um, and so you need multiple checkpoints as you work your way through. OK, so I work through the, the advice that it's giving me, and I'm actually quite happy with what it's done. So I ask it to provide me with the data as a CSV for download so that I can download it and then check it again. So once I've checked it again, so that's two checks within that process, I ask it to confirm that the data set is now clean and suitable for the full hydrograph production, which is essentially my end goal. And are there any other adjustments needed? So then I read through the advice that it gives. Um, and I'm happy with that. It's not giving any significant recommendations that any major changes need to be made. Um, so I decide to, it's now time to eyeball the data. So not just look at it in the CSV, but get it to create some graphs for me. So I ask it to create hydrographs for all the wells, um, and it does so. So when you're working with data, it's actually, um, this tool is not going to be too much of a use for me unless I'm familiar with my data. So this, is, this has to be like a site which I'm familiar with so that I can go through and be like, okay, yeah, I know that site, particular site has longer issues and has spikes and dropouts and stuff like that or there's some discontinuities in data or something. Um, so because of my experience, I can go through and eyeball all of, this, all of these hydrographs. So I'm not concerned about these spikes because I'm, I know that's happening with that site. So I'll work my way through and this is my third checkpoint. So I go through all my graphs. You can see there's quite a lot of them because there was 10,000 lines of data. And then I decide that I'm happy with the data and it all looks, it all looks plausible, plausible to me and that I'm ready to download the CSV and then move on to the next, the next step, which would be producing hydrographs or doing some analysis or, or something like that. So at this point, this is a problem which I identified as happening all the time. So if, if this chat times out, how do I prevent just having to do all of these steps every single time um, and then automate it down the track? And this is a solution to that. So when I get to the end of any chat, which I think that is going to have, that I'm have, going to have to solve this problem again, um, I need to give it a prompt like this. And I'll read it out to you just so you can't see, in case you can't see it. I want to be able to conduct this process again here in ChatGBT using the original data I provided 
Please provide a prompt that I would use when uploading data again and provide some example code that will allow me to do like this process again. So it's giving me a prompt which I can use again in the future and it's giving me some example code. It's actually irrelevant um, or it's actually not entirely important that you understand the code. The reason I'm asking for the code is so that I can provide an example uh, when I do this process again because examples are extremely powerful in getting uh, large language models to do things consistently. So if you're not giving it a solid example, you might just, um, it might not transform the data the same again. It might be totally different each time because it's giving you the most probable result. So this is your opportunity to get organized. And so when, when you've got to the first, um, you've solved your first problem, this is what you need to do. You need to create yourself a little folder structure like I've used for the presentation today. And you need to start cataloging your problems from the very beginning. Because I didn't do this for about, I don't know, eight months and it caused me nightmares. Like I, I, I found it really hard to repeat things um, over and over again. So what you need to do is you need to save your chat URL and you need to put that in a document. And then you need to save your prompt. And then you need to save your code. So that this is something you can come back to later and save yourself a lot of time. And I'm going to show you how to set up an automation as, as described earlier uh, in this presentation. So the next example that we're going to go through is the merging of data. Um, and that needs to, be, needs to be done a little bit differently. You need to be a little bit, a little bit um, methodical in the way that you're, uh, when you're dealing with like multiple files, especially when they're large. Um, so the advice is to take it step by step. Um, and so what I mean by that is that I'm just going to work with the two files uh, in this example. Uh, but I'm, if I was working with more, I wouldn't just throw them all at ChatGPT at once and give it a really complicated um, series of steps to do because the probability of uh, the, the result being wrong you know, becomes much higher. And this is just in my, in my experience. So I'll jump into this example and show you what I mean. So this is the same data set as I've cleaned before. And here's a little tip of whenever you're uploading new data, I always use this little, little um, prompt and that's just inspect and describe this data. And the reason I ask it to do this is because um, it's like getting on the same page with uh, ChatGPT. You want it to describe the data to you and you want to agree with it to make sure that you're both on the same page so that it doesn't go off and make any decisions for you which are wrong. So here I've given it, I've read through its interpretation of the data and it's giving me a sample of the data. Um, I've give it, given it something to check based on my experience and that's that um, sometimes ChatGPT doesn't sort the data properly um, and it can cause anomalies for um, time series data uh, when you're putting it in graphs and stuff like that. So I ask it to check if the data set is sorted by date column just to make sure and if it's not, just to deal with that. And so it goes through makes a transformation. Sorry, Matt. That's Sorry. a very general instruction you're giving it, that second line. Is it, yeah. uh, additionally, identify and correct any issues that might arise. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. And so that's why you need to check what it's done after it. And so I am using some fairly general prompts um, in this presentation. Um, but I think I've just done that so I don't confuse people with really long prompts. I'm going to show you some really long prompts too um, when I do the automations. Um, so, yeah, in general, I would be a lot more specific about what I'm asking ChatGPT um, as I'm going through and working with data. Uh, but I've just made a decision just to keep it kind of a little bit more simple so we don't get hung up on the details. But it's a great, it's a great question, and you're right. I, I should be more specific, uh, and I'll demonstrate that shortly. Um, right, so now I'm happy with the data itself. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the next step. And in this case, I'm only interested in two wells in my data set. So I'm just going to ask ChatGPT to show me wells 11 and 12. So the reason I'm doing this uh, before I actually bring in any new data is so that I can see the, the untransformed data. So that I've got something to compare to after. So now I've got my reference of the untransformed data and what it looks like. So then I move to bring in the uh, the, the next data set, which is the Bureau of Meteorology rainfall data, and it's from the Flemington Rain Gauge, if you're from Melbourne. So I just put a prompt in there. I'll say, I would like to add some rainfall data to the graph, but first I would like you to inspect and describe this rainfall data by the catch. So I'm doing, I'm going back to doing the ball, just getting on the same page to see that the, the chat GPT understands the data as I do. 
and you can see that here's the issue with the combination of data which trips a lot of people up it's you've got you've got um dates spread across three columns whereas the uh the data set that i'm trying to combine it with has just got a single um a single column per date and i ask it to i'm happy with how it's uh, understood the data so now i ask it to plot the rainfall data on its own in its untransformed state so that I've got something to compare back to. So I'm, I'm always setting myself up during these conversations so that I can go back and check things. And, and you're going to need to do that too if, you, if you're going to get the, um, the correct outputs that you want. Okay, so now I've got something to refer back to. Now I can ask it to add the rainfall um, to the hydrograph you produced for well 11 and 12, and it does that. So you can see how simple it is and how well it does it. Um, brings it up, and now I can compare that rainfall uh, bar graph to the previous uh, graph that I had just to check that it looks correct and I can also compare the hydrograph to the previous untransformed hydrographs as well to see that they look correct. So I'm happy with that. I just make some minor y-axis adjustments here and then I end up something with something I'm quite happy with which I can use for a report or something like that. So then again I'm, I'm probably going to want to do this process again in the future so I'm going to use a similar prompt to what I did previously I want to be able to conduct this process again using the original data. Please provide a prompt and some example code that will allow me to conduct this process again and produce the same output. So we get our URL, we save that, we save our prompt, and then we save our code as well as our example. And then we put that in our little file structure um, or, or folders just so that we can come back to that should we want to um, make this an automation or to speed the process up in the future. So you can see there's a bit of a similar sort of methodology um, for all of these examples that I'm showing you. Um, and I think having, having this sort of um, strict approach will, will really help you going forward. So this is my favourite part, and this is where I'm going to come to talking about the libraries, um, so the, the Python libraries. And our little friend here says Plotly is the word, and Plotly is actually one of those libraries, and it's a really versatile library which allows you to interact with data. So one of the limitations of ChatGPT is that uh, you, it doesn't have much, um, allow much interactivity within the chat. So you can get some fairly basic interactivity with graphs that it produces, um, but you can't zoom in and you can't sort of um, interact much with the data. However, you can use the Plotly library um, to generate these HTML dashboards, which you can then download and interact with the data. And I'll just demonstrate how this works. So we're going to start with our clean groundwater level data again that we were using previously. Again, asking it to inspect and describe this data. And then it's going to go through and describe the data. Um, and I'm all happy with that once I've read through what it's, what it's suggesting, what it's done, all of its summary. Um, then I'll use something like this as a prompt. I want to produce, a, uh, I want to use Plotly to produce a HTML dashboard which I can download. Before you try to produce this, are there any issues with the data that might cause problems producing an interactive time series dashboard? So the reason I've decided to sort of reiterate that and, and what I'm doing with it is because um, the way that it treats the data for a popular dashboard might be slightly different to if I'm just generating some graphs or static graphs. Okay, so then it goes through and makes any sort of conversions it needs to do. I make sure that I read all this. It makes some recommendations around uh, date format, you know, measurement method differences, outliers, and all this kind of stuff. Once I've read through, just based on my own opinion, uh, working with data, I've decided I only need to deal with the date format. So you can see that there's some requirement of expertise in this. Like, it's if you don't have an understanding of your data, then you may you may slip up on some of these steps. So I've decided to just focus on the date format because I know that that's what the most important uh, transformation part is for time period data. And then it moves on and then it produces the dashboards. And I'm going to show you what the dashboard looks like. Just let me open it up. So this is the dashboard of the data um, that I've just put in. And you can interact and turn off all the different sites that you want to look at and you can zoom in. Um, and I find these sort of dashboards particularly useful just for getting a feel of all your data together. They're very quick to spin up, very easy to spin up. Um, and this can assist you in things like, you know, determining what your y-axis and x-axis scales are for your batch graphs and things like that. So this is something you can do very early on in your data exploration. But Plotly is really versatile um, and you can have other forms of interactivity 
um, like this example where I've got So this is tide data. This is another example where I've embedded some uh, moving averages, which you can adjust and interact with the data this way. Um, so this is just like a single single dashboard, but I've also been able to develop like a Swiss Army knife kind of dashboard looking at multiple things too for that same time that, uh, tide data, where you've got descriptive, descriptive statistics, um, the time series data, sort of a basic correlation analysis, distribution analysis, basic anomaly detection and anomalies table. So you can do stuff like that too. Um, and you can also do stuff like this, which is my favorite, let's bring it up, which is a 3D contaminant distribution model. Um, and so this is a theoretical uh, excavation. You might be doing a tank pool or something like that, or you've done some, um, some drilling and you've got some soil samples from zero to eight meters in depth. Uh, and then here's the size of the pit, which might be eight by eight. Um, and so you can pick a specific contaminant and then you can look at its distribution working down in the pit um, and what the concentrations are. So you can do stuff like this too. You can actually um, record this as a video and have like an MP4 of the, of the progression of the contaminant down the pit. Yeah, so loads of stuff you can do with plotting. I mean, that's only just a small amount. So, you know, and this goes for the other libraries as well. They all do different things um, and they all do, so they all do quite powerful things. You just have to put a bit of time into finding out what they do. So Matt, how long would it take to set up something like that? Uh, which one? The last one, the excavation. So you bring in your spatial set of data and... So this one was, I, I used synthetic data for this. And so the way that I approached it is that I told it my problem. And I said, if I was to, you know, well, it was more of a question. I said, can you do 3D contaminant distribution modeling? Just because I heard someone asking that who I was working with. And I'm like, hmm, they were using a, some a paid proprietary program to do that. I'm like, I wonder if, if Python can do that. I wonder if ChatGPT can do that. And so I asked it and I said, can you do this? And I'm like, okay, well, um, you know, if I was using this data and I had a pit this size and can you produce some data for me so that I can actually see it? So this, I've, I've, I got it to generate data for me so that I could test this. And I would say it took me 15 minutes. Um, and then the cool thing about that is that you can then download that data and you know what the structure needs to be. So if you're going to do this in the future, you're like, okay, great. Well, I just need to get my data into that structure from, from my project. And, and then I can use the code from this to, to do another model. Um, yeah, so you can, there's a lot of power actually in asking it to just generate synthetic data for you and just trying things out um, and then seeing if you can reverse engineer that back to your project. All right, so that's Plotly dashboards. Um, same deal. Um, if I wanted to do the same thing again, I would just give it a similar prompt as last time. I want to be able to conduct this process again using the original data. Please provide a prompt and some example code that will allow me to conduct this process again and produce the same output. Um, so, you know, this method's not definitive, by the way. This is something I've developed myself. Um, and one of the fun things about this kind of technology is that just different people doing different things their own way. So it's just like, I would love to hear from anyone who says, no, you're doing it, you're making it hard for yourself, you know, try this way. And I'd love that. So please reach out and let me know if you have better ideas about things. All right. So consistent graphs. Um, I'll just go through where you would start. Um, so in terms of getting consistent graphs, which are consistent with the colours of your organisation, consistent with the formatting of your organisation. So something that you can use again and again and again. Um, and matches with your, your own templates, whatever. Um, and this is where uh, another bit of advice for this one is use examples. The examples which I've generated so far are like example code, but I'm going to show you how to use just images, just to show it images and say, I want to do this. Can you, can you do it? So this kind of shows you the length of the conversation you might need to go through to get to something that you're happy with. And it's quite long. Uh, but it does show that there needs to be that sort of initial investment in terms of getting things right um, and, and spending the time doing that. Um, and then after that, you can start, you can start um, solving those problems quicker. So again, the data goes in, I say inspect and describe. I go through and review its own interpretation of the data and whether I agree with it or not. Um, then I ask it to show some examples of the, of the data in a hydrograph. Um, I've done this just to demonstrate the previous point which I told you about the sorting of data. And so sometimes you'll see something that looks a bit like this. It'll come up. 
Um, it's not going to come up. Okay. So the, you can see these lines, which are kind of a, a bit out of whack. And, and it's, it's they're connecting, you know, one date here to a date further up along the x-axis timeline. And so that's a bit indicative of what happens when the sorting is not done properly. So that's why I keep coming back to that. So I've asked it to just check the date column and the source data to make sure it's properly sorted. And then it does that. And then I ask it to plot the graphs again and they look, they look a bit different and that actually looks correct to me. So then I'm, I work through and get it to show me the graph separately. Um, and so I'm just looking at what kind of format it's giving me. Um, this isn't quite really what I'm happy with in terms of the orientation of the text and the axes and the, the colors of the uh, baselines and things like that. So I've actually gone back to a previous report and I'm like, okay, well, here's a graph which I do want to replicate again. Um, and this is consistent with the style guide. So I just, I just give it this image. And I say, I would like to format and style the format and style of the hydrographs graphs that you generate to be similar to this example from a previous report. And that just kind of helps guide it um, along the way. So it gives me something um, which is a bit, that's quite close and it's got the colors fairly close, um, but there's still some other adjustments and stuff like that. You can see here that I've just been switching between this basic interactive functionality, which it gives you. And this is what I was talking about previously, but it's not that great. I can't really kind of zoom in. You can make some color changes in here, but I'm more interested in the static graphs. So you can actually switch it to the Python static graphs because that's what I want for my reports. So I keep working through this process, um, having a bit of back and forth in terms of uh, where I want it to go. I've even given it the same image again because it's gone a bit off track just to get it back on track. Uh, but it's a useful thing to know about images. It is quite helpful and, and it can do it quite well to get to get something to a style that you want. So you see, I'm still working all the way through, experimenting with colors. So the main thing I want you to get out of this is that it's just, it's a process of going through and experimenting. Um, and then I eventually get to something which I'm happy with, which looks like this. Um, and then I do exactly the same thing as I did in the previous uh, conversations. And then I say, the, I ask it to provide a prompt and some example detailed code. So I'm just gonna quickly show you how much quicker it is once you've got that example um, prompt and code. And here's the second attempt. Now getting back to your happy if I should be more detailed about um, the prompt, Richard, this is kind of, this is what makes things easier, this, this length of prompt. Um, and this is what really gets you close to the sort of automating processes. So I actually just put the prompt in from that last conversation and I'll just, up, and I'll just give it the data. Um, and it, and it, gives, it gives the prompt, it gives the example. And then it just goes straight out and gives me the graphs and they look exactly <coughs> as I want them. You've so then that's, there, that's, that's Sorry, Matt, you put in there, you've told it to use Python. Mm -hmm. I, why did you tell it? Why don't you let it choose what it wants to use there? Why are you getting specific about Python? So was that in the in the first prompt? Yeah. Um, that was actually, ChatGPT came up with that itself from the previous session. So summarising to ask Python. And it will default to Python because Python is the, it's the programming language it uses in its own programming environment. So the technical term for like, uh, the programming environment that ChatGPT uses, it's called Code Interpreter. And so that, that only uses Python. So I don't know why it said specifically to use Python when it should already know that anyway. You know how you showed the picture of the graph you wanted it to um, emulate? Yep. Was that just like a PDF image or a... It was just a PNG. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of power in using images. I mean, I could go into some other examples, but just keep it in mind, you know, you can just get it to look at things. And um, I know I've been to some great um, presentations uh, through the Australian Water School and that were showing some examples using engineering drawings and stuff like that. And you just basically give it engineering drawings and it all does a pretty good job of understanding what's going on. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's pretty it's pretty cool how it can deal with, you know, it can deal with images. Um, yeah, so that's how to how much quicker it is once you've got your expanded detailed prompt and examples. All right, so we're going to finish off with looking at um, how to pull this together in terms of creating automation. How do you create your own custom version of ChatGPT, which you already know what to do? So I've largely shown you how to, the methodology of how to get to that, and that's, that's about saving the prompts for the processes.
saving the examples and, and cataloging them. And if you do that, uh, making automation is going to be much easier for you. So the power, I think, in using uh, something like ChatGBT to automate a process um, is that you can actually set up a custom version of ChatGBT to guide you to do things, and it can force you to be more of a critical thinker, uh, which is a little bit different to just running a script. Um, and I think that's where the power of using large language models is to do, is to do better work. So here's an example of a, of a, a custom GPT which I've built. And I've got the chat GPT and I've got the user there. So it shows you that the process of using this automation is actually, it, it requires chat GPT and it requires you. Um, it's not just doing something for you. So the process starts by putting data in and chat GPT knows to transform the data. It then asks you to inspect the data and provide guidance on the format of the graphs. And then chat GPT generates graphs and then it seeks your approval of those graphs. So it asks you to check for certain things. Once you've done that and you've given the approval, then ChatGPT produces a Word document with data summaries. So I'll just show you an example of what that looks like, and I'll show you what the prompt looks like to achieve something like that. So this is my custom GPT. It's a custom version of, um, of ChatGPT, and it's specifically for graph automation and summary. That's what it's for. And it's preloaded with all the knowledge to do that. If we go into the back end of this, you'll see that in the configuration, you give the, you give the GPT a name, you give it a description, and then you give it instructions. And you can see that these instructions are quite detailed. And they're a combination of all the things that I've just saved in the previous problems, which I've tried to solve. And it's chained, it's chained them together into steps. And for example, step one, data inspection. It gives a detailed prompt. It gives examples and guidelines. It gives example code for that particular step. And then it also generates a dashboard so that you can check your data. So it puts a whole lot of things together. Step two is where it, I've given it instructions to prompt you to determine what the formatting should be. I've even preloaded it with some baseline levels, which it can ask you to whether you want them included in your graphs or have them changed. You can put all sorts of information in here. And then it moves on to the create a summary document step. And it even gives like, when I talk about examples, there's other examples, you can give it example interaction so that it has, an ex so that it has some knowledge of how, how you might actually interact with this GPT. So that's how the back end looks. And I'll just show you what the actual interaction looks like. So I'd simply launch this GPT and it would come up with the chat and I would just drop my, my data into it. And then it starts going through those steps. Data inspection, data preparation and portfolio dashboard creation. It gives you the dashboard. It asks you to specify the axis ranges. I tell it what the axis ranges should be. Interestingly, I've done that wrong. I've said, oh, I want the x-axis to be 2016 to 2014. And it's like, why would you put that backwards? So I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, correct. So it's, it's actually directed me. It's asking me if I want any of these uh, baselines included or if I want any changes to the baselines made. I'm like, no, they're fine. So it's guiding me through this whole process. And then it just it knows to present me with the graphs. They, they are all clean. They're all the same color. They're all in the same format. And it asks me for approval. And I don't give it approval because I look at the graphs and I'm like, where's the log of data? Why, why is it not there? And so then it goes through and adds it. And this is an artifact of it giving you the most probable answer. So sometimes because of the nature of large language models, they will miss things sometimes. And so you need to be able to pick up that. But then it puts it back in, it figures that out pretty quickly, got all my graphs, and then it seeks my approval. I'm like, the graphs are fine. And then it saves them all as PNGs and then inserts them into a summary document. And then it gives me the summary report. And I'll just show you what this looks like. So here's the report. You can just download the Word document. You can specify a uh, formatting of the actual document using Markdown, or you can give it an example of um, your own uh, company template. And I've also given it some instructions to do some basic summaries on the statistics, the basic ranges, the averages, the max, the min, all that kind of stuff, which then you can use for your report. So I'm trying to work on a more detailed um, uh, version of this, um, where it can, so I'm still sort of getting my head around how to, how to get this working and give you some more um, 
some more sophisticated kind of outputs. So yeah, so that's basically the endpoint of, uh, of tying all those processes together and what it looks like. So I'll just go through a few negatives and I'll start with the negatives first. And I think the biggest negative with um, particularly ChatGPT is the, is the ephemeral disk space. That's pretty annoying. It would be cool if you could just go back and keep working that conversation. Um, but yeah, so that, that the way that I've shown you to go around it is how you're going to have to do it for a moment. Um, and it can be at hard. It can be hard at first to get consistent and accurate output. So um, I think it would really help if you follow the sort of methodology I've shown you. And, and you know, I'm sure other people have got better ideas than me in terms of um, how to get it even more consistent. Um, but yeah, you'll you'll struggle with that uh, when you first start out. Um, and there's still periods where there is where there's downtime or slow speed. And the thing you have to remember is that these companies are still research companies. Um, so OpenAI, you, you know, on ChatGPT, they're still really improved, like um, iterating at a really fast rate. So they're making changes all the time. Um, so that can be a little bit of a risk if you're we're looking at kind of um, relying on this technology. But it has improved a lot, like since I've been using it just in the last, you know, uh, 12 months, it's, it's, it's got a lot more capable and reliable. So just in terms of the, the positives, I mean, I, I think there is significant opportunity for competitive advantage in the sense that, uh, you know, just saving time and, and the potential to do better work as well. So, you know, you can see that some of these uh, examples I've shown you how it prompts you to actually, to actually think more um, and therefore you can get better work out of that. Um, and I think the technology is exponentially improving. Like I tend to try and build stuff which doesn't work um, with the expectation that in six months it will. Uh, as the models get better. So that's that's kind of an exciting part about working with it. Um, it's just improving so quickly. And But I also want to stress that when you're thinking about using large language models or, uh, you know, this form of AI for your work, just don't get too obsessed with the time-saving part of it um, because, you know, there is there's real opportunity, I think, if not more opportunity, just to do better better quality work. Um, so, yeah, and that's, that's why I'm interested in it. All right, well, um, that's it for my presentation. So I'll just, maybe we can jump into the questions, Richard. I'll stop sharing my screen. Sounds good. Share mine. No chat GPT, there we go. Um, okay, share. You can write me a little routine for that one. That'd be tremendous. Okay. So over to questions and answers. Matt, that was fantastic, actually. It's kind of mind-blowing, I must admit. Um, certainly think it's got some applications for a business like Hydro Turret. Early bird questions. Well, a lot of people got up early. Number one, how to use API chat GPT instead of API GPT 3.5 in Australia? Did I say GPT-4? Yes. Um, yeah, GPT-4. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, uh, so with the API, you can use the API within GPTs to um, to call on databases, and you can use digital assistants, which are kind of like GPTs, where you would uh, use the, the API to use ChatGPT outside of ChatGPT, essentially. So you have the option to, when you're using ChatGPT via the API, um, you can select which model you want to use. And I'm not aware that there's anything preventing you from using uh, the 3.5 model versus the GPT-4 model in Australia. It's just a matter of um, different models cost, uh, have different cost structures. Um, so I'm not quite sure if I can answer that question more than that. Um, yeah. Okay, no, that's all right. There's plenty more. Uh, question number two, the origin of the data sets for training and its relevance to Australian scenarios. Yeah, ChatGPT is a bit of a black box in terms of I, I've got no idea what its training data is. Um, and so it's hard, it's hard to answer that in terms of what, it's, what the origin of its data sets are. Um, and in terms of its relevance to Australian scenarios, what will determine the relevance is your skill in giving it at in giving it the relevance. 
So when you're designing a prompt or something like that, or you're asking it questions, you might actually provide it with, um, if you're asking it about uh, certain scenarios or you're using a certain methodology, you can provide it with the examples, with the relevant examples to help guide it to be more relevant to your use case. And so that all comes, that all comes down to the skill of, uh, you know, having conversations with chat GPT. There's, you know, heaps of free resources to just improve your prompt engineering skills or your skills in having conversations with a large language model. If you go to Coursera, um, they've got entire Gen AI, um, you know, course streams for free. And so I think really it's less about um, knowing about the origin of the training data, but more about learning the skills in providing the large language model, the relevance that it, the information that it needs to give you advice. Question number three, will AI not face difficulties in the environmental sector? Experts may refuse approval. Yeah, um, yeah, it already is facing difficulties because you sort of have to get over, um, I think there's a couple of hurdles if you haven't made a start with it in your organisation um, and that's around uh, like reseeding expectations. Like you can see that it just, it doesn't do everything for you. Like you actually need to work with it. Um, so, and I think what people think AI can do is different to what I, how it can actually help you. Um, and, and then you have to, you know, the next difficulty that you have to get over is just like, is like the fear of using it as well. So a lot of people are coming at it in fear. So I've helped some managers and stuff in the past in terms of like um, training sessions for using AI for their jobs. And, and it's, it's, yeah, it's a matter of kind of overcoming that fear. Um, and yeah, so, and, and that would that would relate to refusing of approval as well. So you sort of have, you know, you have to deal with that. Um, again, there's heaps of information in terms of dealing with that. Um, so the CSIRO has an AI centre um, and there's some great information coming out of the, coming out of the um, University of Sydney, Coursera, like I said, um, there's a university in the US called Vanderbilt University who provide a lot of guidance in terms of like, how do you overcome those barriers and how do you give people confidence and make them feel safe with using AI? Okay, that's going to be one of the big ones, I suppose. Use of AI to read water level from photograph on a gauge board would speed up citizen science projects. Yeah, I haven't done this. Um, I mean, I think this would be quite a, an actual simple task for a data scientist. Um, I do know that there's like Python libraries, which already exist for, uh, you know, interpreting photos um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that would be... Uh, if you found, so I can't add to this one, but I do know that if you asked a data scientist who has some machine learning experience using R or, or Python, I, I, I think that would be a pretty simple problem to solve with a, with a camera, with a simple internet camera, or, you know, something that sends a photo to an inbox and then you would just have a script which interprets that photo. I've seen it done, actually. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, number five, I'm interested in the potential for soil data interpretation for report writing purposes. Yeah, I think if you use the methods which I've described, um, you can see that, you know, when any, if you're working with like a soil data, if it's, I assume it's analytical data, um, you might be working with guidelines or thresholds or something like that. I kind of touched on the example that I went through with hydrographs and baselines. You can do a sort of similar thing in terms of, um, with chemistry data as well. And then you could do something with a report where you could get it to uh, table all the exceedances or something like that, and then provide a description of that and then give you a hydro and a table. You could do stuff like that uh, with, with um, ChatGPT. Uh, next one I can answer. Uh, yes, the webinar will be available on, if you come onto our website on about Tuesday, the recording will be up there and you can just log in and view it. Number seven, will there be cyber security issues arising from the use of chat GPT for corporations? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the way you smile as you said that. Okay. I think it's just because, um, you know, every digital product we use is going to be having cyber security issues, uh, you know, going forward forever. Um, but, you know, to be more clear about that, I think the main um, issue is that Organisations really need to, as a first step, like figure out their own acceptable use policy. Um, and then, you know, I've seen organisations make certain decisions based on that acceptable use policy. So, for example, um, 
there's different versions of ChatGPT, for example. Um, so one is like the free version. Uh, one is the plus version, which is the lowest tier pay version. Um, I use the team version, which is a paid version, and, and that's designed for small businesses. And then there's enterprise. So enterprise and teams have uh, enterprise level security. So they have this thing called SOC2 compliant audits of security. Um, and whereas, whereas the lower levels, um, they can use your data to train their models, um, which has a security risk. So one organisation that I've seen using ChatGPT Enterprise has made certain decisions to, to try to uh, mitigate for those cyber security issues. And one of those things was like not connecting it to the internet. And I know, I know that sounds weird, but sometimes when you're using ChatGPT, if you ask it a question, it'll go off to the internet to find out an answer uh, for that. Um, so they've decided to restrict um, use of that um, connection. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think each, each organisation is going to need to decide how they deal with that based on what they're using it for at the end of the day. Have you ever asked ChatGPT to do something and it said no? Or it always have a go? Um, most times it'll have a go. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's funny, like it can be a bit lazy and you have to be like, come on, come on, keep trying, you know? Or you have to say, I want to be trying until you figure this out, you know? Um, and and that sounds funny, but it's actually really useful because it means that if it ever gets to a point where it says it can't do something, just go ahead and ask it to say, uh, I, I want you to try again. I want you to give me five, five solutions and, <laughs> and do that. So you, sometimes you can get it to solve things even when it won't um, initially. Okay. Better get going on these questions. All right. Number eight, could you describe the last three times you have used AI to solve a problem and how the AI has assisted in this? Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, those common examples I've just shown in this presentation, that's the yeah. yeah, most common I've ever yeah. Number nine, how machine learning, machine learning, learning can assist in assessing large hydrochemical data sets and identify patterns in water quality issues? You can do, I mean, there's certain, like, um, aspects of machine learning you can do in ChatGPT in terms of, like, uh, models and stuff like that, but it does have limitations where you would have to actually, you know, get someone like a, again a data scientist to actually get in there and do that, do that locally, not in ChatGPT. Um, so it's, I mean, it's quite a broad question, um, other than to just say that, um, you know, it can assist in assessing large hydrochemical data sets. Um, but could it automatically do a piper plot for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, um, you can do that in SDAP. Mm. Spin off a pipe of plot in that too. Okay. Sometimes you have to be a bit careful because if you ask it to do a pipe of plot, uh, something like a pipe of plot, like I've had, I'm just going to give you an example of how you can get you can uh, get a bit run off track. I was trying to get it to do like a um, man Kendall, a trend analysis, and it went off and it did it, but it actually doesn't even have the the, the proper man Kendall Python library available to it. And yet it still gave me a result. So this is what I mean about the model being helpful. Uh, you have to be quite careful about, you know, you need to have enough expertise and enough experience to just be like, oh, hang on a minute. You know, if I just accepted that result, maybe nobody would have noticed, but if I've gone and compared it to an actual uh, man candle, which has been run locally or something like that, you pretty quickly see that there was something wrong with it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like if you wanted to go to the pub and it's a Friday afternoon, you might just be tempted to... Yeah. <laughs> All right, reading on. Um, how number ten? Do you think that Excel should not be solely used for analysing complex data sets? Uh, I mean, I think it's just this is a case of like Excel is not suitable for everything, and ChatGPT is not suitable for everything. Absolutely not suitable. So don't don't make AI this hammer that you want to use for everything. <laughs> you need to actually determine what tasks is it actually good for. So. You know, I think Excel is a great tool. It's just like you should continue using it for lots of things. Um, and, but I, I do think AI has got a place to play in this um, in terms of going forward, particularly this, um, you know, there's competitors coming up with similar stuff to what I've just shown you. There's a company called Anthropic. He's one of OpenAI's competitors, and they've got a new model called, I think it's called Claude Sonnet 3.5, and they've got a similar kind of code interpreter environment where you can do data stuff. And they're doing some really cool stuff with like dashboards, which you can spin up and then share with other people. And then, um, yeah, so it, it'll, it has a place to play, but no, I don't, I don't think you should ditch your old tools completely. 
Where do you see AI within the environmental industry in 10 years' time? One pro and one con of an AI future. <laughs> i got no idea. 10 years' time is a long time. I feel like I'd find it hard to predict where it's going to be in one year's time. Um, but I think really the future, I think, is about that integration with um, uh, you, you're going to see this sort of style of interacting with data, but that there'll be a connection to your company database. So I think what I think what uh, companies are going to have to do is like um, sort of change the way that they they manage their data and they set up the data. Um, so I'm no data scientist, so I can't uh, sort of talk about that. But I do see that being the biggest thing is that you'll actually have these tools connected to your database, and then you can do this query. You don't you won't necessarily need to, need to be adding files to the chat and then have a time out. Um, and stuff like that. And I think that you'll there'll be an easy way to just create these automation tools and share them with everyone. Um, so maybe there'll just be less sort of, um, you know, giant spreadsheets that you have to go into and reverse engineer to figure out to do something to complete a report. Uh, it, it'll just be a different way of using data. Okay. Based on your experience, how can we ensure AI doesn't produce telephone numbers rather than real information? I assume telephone numbers means incorrect data. Um, yeah, I guess so. So I think I think it's really about following that process, which I've just gone through, and just really embedding, you know, like be professional, like just um, really embed those check processes, leverage your own experience, um, and, yeah, just embed that in your process in checking so that you can pick up if anything looks wrong, which you have to do anyway, you know, even if you're using Excel, you've got to double check things. Next one, using AI to analyze and visualize water quality data and its potential GIS capabilities. So how does it handle that sort of spatial interface? I've seen uh, workshops which I haven't attended on uh, QGIS or QGIS. Um, and that there's, there, it was like an AI integration into that program. Um, so, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be integrated with all these sort of uh, GIS programs. ArcGIS will have, you know, I'm sure it probably already does have some of that functionality in there. Um, yeah, so you'll just see it kind of sneaking in, just like um, lots of other products at the moment. But in terms of analysing and visualising water quality data, you can approach that in the same way as the example which I've shown you. But just instead of time series, groundwater level, you can work with um, analytical data. Do you think in the future, like just to sneak an extra early bird question, um, like what well, produces this code at the end, effectively it's sort of like this is what we've done to the data, that sort of list do you think auditors are going to have to audit that is that sort of the provenance of that ultimate thing that they've got in front of them yeah i think i mean i would i would want it to be you know um just like it needs to become i guess part of the review of you know as you're working your way through information and you need to demonstrate the what you've used and how you've used it and what what uh, steps you've taken to validate that data. So you just have to continue doing the same thing that most people are already doing, um, but just find a way to do it you know, you know, with a new method. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Because in the past, you might have just drawn a line on a map and handed it over and said, yeah, that's my best guess, and no one really drills into it, do they? But now, now they might be able to. Um, Number 14, do you use Python as well to do your analysis? Yeah, so sometimes you'll find you'll hit a limitation. So one of the limitations at the moment is um, having uh, having a connection to a live database. So there was one instance where, um, you know, so if you, for example, if you wanted to connect to a file and you wanted to interact with it visually or something like that, and then if you want the changes that you make uh, to that data to be reflected in the original source file, uh, it's not really possible to do that within the chat GPT chat. Um, so you would need to then move that code to a Python environment and, and do it there. In that case, you know, yeah, you, you, you use chat GPT to help you develop the code. Um, and then you can actually save it as like a notebook. As a, so if you're using something like a Jupyter notebook, you can, you can ask it to save it as a Jupyter notebook, which you, you can then take to your local computer and then further develop it from there. So yeah, you'll definitely find limitations. And it doesn't actually have access to all the Python libraries. So there might be some 
uh, like, you know, for example, when I was talking about Man Kendall before, there is a Pi Man, Pi Man Kendall, I think it's called, but it's just not available for ChatGPT. Uh, so in that instance, you would have to go uh, and, and do it locally. Okay, I think we'll skip over 15. I think that's been addressed. Number 16, semi-automating environmental data using machine learning. Well, I mean, I think I've kind of shown you a, I guess what I've shown has been a way of semi-automating environmental data. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I mean, you know, data scientists have been using machine learning to do stuff for, for a long time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can semi-automate using machine learning or you can use ChatGPT or something else as well. Um, they're just different ways of doing them. All right. So now... We'll go to our other questions. You happy to keep going a bit longer, Matt? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. We've got 14 more questions. <laughs> How would you best balance data governance, therefore customer data contaminant monitoring and innovative AI technologies? I think it comes down to that sort of um, acceptable use policy, like, you know, deciding, um, I'm just trying to pick this apart. So how would you best balance data governance? You need to figure out your policy to begin with so that you, um, yeah, you don't, because it depends how confidential that data is in, in terms of how you use it with AI. So you really need to nail down and think about, um, you know, how, what is your own company's acceptable use policy and then go from there. And then that plays into uh, your own data governance or how AI plays into your data governance because every company has their own form of data governance anyway, like HydroTerra would. Um, but AI is just another part of that. So you need to figure out how that sort of fits in with your own data governance based on, you know, what privacy issues and how sensitive the data is and all that kind of stuff. Next question, Eleanor Pritchard. Have you checked in with a previous project's data on the contaminant map to see if it provides an accurate map that would be helpful for excavation as per the example provided? So, you know, that so excavation that, one where you... Have you done that on a real job? Like, had a look? No, I haven't done that particular one on a real job. No, that was something which I came up specifically for the presentation just because I'd heard about it and I was like, oh, I wonder if you can do that. And, you know, could you solve this problem? With, um, yeah, but most of the, when I've seen that being done, it's been using proprietary products. But have you compared it, like where you've had a raw data set with, say, some figures that someone else has done? No, nah, not not for that particular tool. No. I'd like to see the that. Data, yeah, the data set is actually quite simple. Like if you've got, you know, eight metres by eight metres, you've essentially just got a list of, results from different depths. So when you look at the CSV from that, whilst the, the visualisation looks impressive, the actual data itself is, is quite uh, small. So that would be quite easy to cross-check, yeah. Grazia Gargillo. How did you get from Python to the graphs? Um, from Python to the graphs. Did you just ask it to do it? And it did the graphing, I think, is the question. Yeah, so I think further down the track after I've been using it for a while. So one thing when it's worth having a bit of an understanding of Python. Um, so and I learned about how to leverage instructions related to Python from a course, which was another course era course. And it, it is uh, it was coding, it's called, I think it's called Code Interpreter. Um, or ChatGPT code interpreter, it was called. And so that course specifically gave me the knowledge about what it's actually doing with Python and what to understand about how it's using it. So I think I'd, I'd figured it out mostly from that course in terms of using examples. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'd get too much more specific than that. I would have found my way to getting the graph which I want via prompts. But then, I, you know, I, eventually I figured out how to get it to provide me with Python so that it could make it easier down the track. Yeah, I think that might be the answer to the question she's asking. I like this next question by Ron DeCole. Hi, Matthew. Have you asked ChatGPT after the long prompt on how it would make it shorter and easier? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good that's a really good thing to do every time. Yeah. Yep. So you can improve your prompts and processes by by getting some feedback. That's yeah, that's a really good idea. Eduardo Batone. Hi, great presentation. My only concern is about quality assurance. How do you ensure that the data is processed and visualized correctly and not mistakenly, e.g. editing dates wrongly or not correctly, interpolating, etc.? The 3.5 version does provide good initial R Python codes, but often requires a lot of bug fixing. So I guess before validating the developed program, you would have to invest quite some time double checking the outputs of each step. It worries me that people with no Excel or coding experience would blindly rely on chat GPT outputs without being able to triple check what it does. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, it's actually, it's like some, it's an interesting technology because there's some research uh, that I saw recently talking about how usually with these new technologies, uh, it will be the young, um, younger people who will adopt this technology and then bring it up through an organisation. But this is a bit different in terms of that actually this technology is most useful to people who have a lot of experience and then you can leverage that because you've got the ability to check what's been given to you. And so that's what I would say to that. It's just about you just have to find some way. And I got the same question in the last presentation I did too. And, and it, I think the answer is just you have to just think of that from the very start. You're like, how am I going to uh, include this checking process in my methodology? And I've done my best to do that in the examples that I've showed you, but there's there are absolutely better ways to do it, I'm sure. Um, but I think that's the main thing. It's just, you know, you want to be experienced enough so that you can, because, you know, if you've been in Contamland for, or, you know, 10, 20 years or something like that, and you're always looking at spreadsheets, you get pretty good at even just looking at it like a, and there's that chem table and picking out things just because you're so used to it. And that's because of your experience. So it's the same thing with this too. I think it's just a matter of getting creative and, and finding ways to check it. Once you've set it on a code, like you've done all your questioning and you've drilled right down, then the risk's gone from it, hasn't it? Like if you validate that code and you've got, say, a machine that's spitting out more data, but essentially it's going to be the same types of errors and things in it, is it safe to say that or you'd have to... No, I don't, I don't think it's safe to say that. I think you sort of you always need to have that critical eye on anything that's given mm. I still think it can it can still be really helpful, and I still think it can save you a lot of time, um, you know, for the right for the right problems. Um, but yeah, I would I I mean maybe in the future it'll just get so good that you don't have to check it. But it's just like I just can't see a scenario where I wouldn't be extremely critical of what it's giving me. Um, yeah. Well, I hope it keeps listening to you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Matthew, for this great presentation. Do we need access to the plus version of chat GPT? It seems like we can't create a custom design version using the free version. Correct. Yeah, yeah, you will need to pay for it. Um, and I think anything using sensitive data, if you're going to use it for any sensitive data, I, I would only use Teams or Enterprise. Um, yeah, but you will need, you'll need the paid version to create these GPTs. Yeah. Just dropped out a tiny bit when you said, was it Teams or Enterprise? Uh, you'll need, yeah, I, I recommend Teams or Enterprise for any sensitive data. Okay. Does Chat GPT store data as this may have implications for sensitive data? So, team, I think you need to turn off training for if you've got Chat GPT Plus, which is the first tier of, of, um, of the paid version. Uh, so, yes, it will store data. Even in the enterprise and teams level um, subscription, it will store data for uh, 30 days and then it will delete it. Um, if you're interested in any of that, they release white papers for, uh, so if you just look up like ChatGPT team white paper or ChatGPT enterprise white paper, it'll give you a summary on, on and, and answer all those questions in terms of how the data is stored and for how long and other, other stuff like that. So to, to, to nut down into that, you look up the white paper. 
does chat GPT store data? Oh, sorry, I've done that one. Uh, Rudy Moniaga. Hi, Matthew. Could you share what is the custom instruction that you use? Uh, I haven't. I don't tend to use custom instructions too much. Um, I assume that's relating to um, within the GPTs. Uh, but no, I haven't. Haven't used. I didn't use any custom instruction examples in that in the examples that I gave. Next one. Could you please show how you stored instructions for workflow processes that you have set up? So it was just something like, you know, um, sorry, I'm not showing my screen anymore. It was basically just uh, like a folder structure. So create a folder and then you give it, uh, you give that folder name like a problem. So you might be like data transformation. Um, and then within that folder, you just have your different files with your URL, uh, your prompt and then your uh, example code. You might have other examples in there too, like example documents or um, example photos or, or something like that. Um, so it's just a simple folder structure, a way of organising all your information. Some people use like CRMs for that, um, and so you can store it all, all online on a CRM to kind of get organised. Um, but, yeah. Okay, next question. Have you implemented Leonardo Beza? Sorry. Have you implemented these chat GPT generated Python codes in Python? Uh, yeah, for some things I've used it to help me because uh, my, my Python knowledge is like fairly basic. So what I usually do is that if once I reach sort of the limit on what I can understand, I'll just get chat GPT to help me to put together like a, a set of instructions and some example code that I can pass on to a more experienced programmer. Um, you can help to deploy things locally. Next questions from Ping Yeo. Thanks, Matt, for the great presentation. I just tried to create a map for some groundwater bores. I got the first map in HTML format. When I want to do some more, ChatGPT said I have reached my data limit and need to try in 24 hours' time. How could I solve this problem? Uh, you're probably using the you're either using the paid, the free version or the plus version. So you need to get a higher level of subscription to give you more access um, so to more messages. There you go, Ping. Fork out some cash. Um, Steve Cody. Welcome back, Steve. So it's just been sailing all around the world. Um, we have seen cases where chat GPT makes stuff up. Example, a legal briefing was generated that quoted fictitious precedents. How do we protect from poor or misleading interpretations instead of uncritically accepting the return result? Yeah, and look, you know, that's, especially when you're working with text, that's the that's a, that's a risk and, and that has been a thing which I've seen happen over and over again. And even with just some of my own um, experimenting with, you know, I've built like this sort of environmental guideline helpers and stuff where I try and I try and have it give me specific information about specific things. Seems like it's working really well until you double check it uh, and, and go and check, and check the content. So um, I mean I think it's just about not being uncritically accepting. You need and that comes down to like, you know, when you establish like an acceptable use policy for your company, uh, I think there needs to be some like base level training for everyone before they start using it. So they can just really understand um, how it works and what some of these risks are. And just just to not just take the answers for what they are. Do you think the risks of that versus like all the inherent errors in environmental monitoring anyway that it doesn't really matter, Matt? Like we've been putting up with errors for years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's just a case of like when you're working with text, like if you want, if you need a hundred percent correct answer, like at, at this moment, like large language models probably aren't the best. Um, tool. Uh, you can, they can be, but you're going to need to pay more for it and you're going to need to have someone build you a, a bespoke solution. I mean, I've seen it done with text where it does give you really accurate information. I mean, an airline pilot, I think I, I mentioned it to you, Richard, you know, he, he's built his own solution using AI for um, answering questions about flight manuals. You want to be pretty precise about that, you know, because if you're asking how many times you need to fire up your engine, you know, you don't want it to like give you the wrong results. So, it, so that it is absolutely possible, but I just think you just need to know what the limitations are of the different uh, you know, products which are out there. 
So it's just having a hard think about how you want to use it, how your organisation wants to use it, and then educating your staff. You know, from the beginning. I think you just put the fear of God through a few of your listeners there. Uh, <laughs> next question. Does information from your uploads get used as a training data and therefore end up on the screens of other users? Uh, it's possible if you're using the free version or the, or the pro, the um, uh, plus version. That's possible um, if you don't turn off the allow um, training of models thing. And that's that's a concern for most organisations. Um, but that's what team and um, enterprise uh, are designed for, to reduce that risk. Here's an interesting one. Is there a way to feed live data into a GPT prompt to have an active model? I know that you can... Um, I know that you can create a GPT and you can you can make an API call to like a database or um, you know to the internet um, like you can scrape data and stuff like that using the GPT. I've seen that done, um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not sure the answer to that one actually. It's sort of where I'd love Hydroterra to go, you know. So you're yeah. reading in real time and turning things on and off on the basis of. Some clever decision by AI. Uh, Chris Redford, not sure if this has been answered already, but what is the best way to transform non detects half PQL when outputting statistics using chat GPT? Um, I have dealt with this a little bit. Um, look, I mean, I think it's just about being, you need to iterate, iterate your way through the problem. Um, so you need to give it a, a really well sort of structured data set, um, you know. So if you're working with EQLs and stuff like that, you don't just want to give it like a, an SDAT table that's the generic export. It's that you need to structure it a bit differently, I've found. Um, and then it's just a process of like making sure that it understands what you understand about the data set and then give it some instructions about what to do with those, you know, less than detect or, you know, whatever symbols um, and then... You know, so really kind of go through that process like I've shown you in terms of iterating until you get it doing something consistent for you. Um, but it's it's really a problem by problem thing. You just got to, the more complicated it gets, you just have to spend that more time iterating and then testing and then iterating and testing. All right, Matt, guess what? We've finished with questions. Uh, that was fantastic, actually. Actually, really great uh, audience participation. So clearly... Uh, you've uh, sparked a lot of interest there. So really good. And uh, Matt's a, effectively a, a freelance specialist in this area. And I think my take from the presentation is uh, it's equally important to already have an understanding of the environmental data before you start using the AI um, and that, you know, they're, they're actually mutually dependent things there. So... Um, Really great effort, Matt. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, mate. I appreciate it. If people want to get in touch with you, um, what's the best way they do that? Uh, just on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think it was on the um, on the, uh, the event. I think was on the there. last slide here. Yeah. yeah, feel free to reach out and say hello, and, um, and especially if you've got better ways of doing things, I, I want to know. <laughs> So, um, there you go. There's Matt's email at the bottom there. Um, Matthew.l.obrien at proton.me. So let's leave it there, Matt, but many thanks for participating today. It was fantastic. Yeah, no worries at all, Richard. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye, everyone. See ya.